Lord, we want to give and consecrate this time to you. We choose to give of ourselves. We choose to set aside. We choose to lay hold of everything that you have for us this morning. Help us initially to worship you with all that we have. Help us to receive into our hearts all that you would do and speak and reveal into our hearts this morning. We just pray that our hearts would be wide open to receive, to give, to worship you. In Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
May we be fully and wholeheartedly submitted to your word, to your truth, so that your life may flow freely towards us and into us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the greatest things that I love about the word of God is that you can pick it up and pick up the same scripture hundreds, thousands of times, and it can be fresh. And it, I I think as you go on in the Lord, one of the greatest challenges is this thing of thinking that you know the word. And so you just start glossing over things. So let's just start with one verse, Luke chapter 18, verse 9. And he, Jesus also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Doesn't that one verse just begin a deep searching of our hearts? Jesus here was speaking to people who trusted in themselves, who thought they were righteous, who viewed other people with contempt. Other translations say they despised other people. So he was talking to specific people. And I wonder if Jesus is speaking to any of us who may fall, maybe in some little way, into one of those three or two or three of those categories. Do we still in any way trust in ourselves? have confidence 
in ourselves, in our own flesh, our own talents, our own abilities, our own resources. The flip side of that coin is probably every bit as destructive. Just constantly walking around saying, I can't. I can't do this, I'll never be able to do that. So you never actually attempt anything in the Lord. You just walk around saying, I can't do it. You never get out of this thing of either I can't on one extreme on one side of the coin or I will. I'll sort it out, I'll fix it, I'll do it. And never getting into the fullness of I can do all things only through Christ who strengthens me. Then Jesus is also speaking to those who still have this niggling little thing that they think they have some righteousness in and of themselves. And then he, he's talking to those who, who view with contempt. Do we still have anybody who we view with contempt, look down upon, feel superior to? Christians, non-Christians, different church groups, different races, whatever, why ever, however. That there's that little thing in us that, that feels a little bit superior to somebody else. And so Jesus then goes on to tell a parable. And as it, it says there, he's specifically talking to people who fall into one or all three of these categories. So then verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift his eyes up to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Then Jesus says, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. Very interestingly, when the self-righteous Pharisee prayed, it says he actually was praying to himself. A number of translations accurately say that the Pharisee was standing praying these things to himself. In regard, one translation says, in regard to himself. And I think this is just a picture here of somebody who is totally self-absorbed. All his prayers are even just all about him. And you see, superficially, it seems that he's doing the right thing. And he's being scriptural. By first of all, offering up thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you. But what is he thanking God for? I thank you that I'm not like those other guys. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes. And everything I get. The scary thing with this guy is that he was probably, what he was praying was probably absolute truth. He's praying the truth. He probably was an outwardly righteous man who was not into swindling and adultery, not even like the tax collector. Probably true that he did fast twice a week and that he tithed on every little bit that came in. He was probably among those that Jesus was speaking about in Matthew 23, 23. We said they tithe down to every little bit of mint, anise, cumin, and so on. Every little thing meticulously tithed upon. So in terms of outward things and even religious things, he was possibly doing better than many of us. How many of us fast twice a week and tithe on every little thing? We get somebody gives you a hundred rands for something, going to go and give ten rands straight away. So he's he's doing it all. Um, as I say, what he's praying is true. 
But in, in terms of outward things and even religious things, he's, he's got it all right. But the problem is that even though he's praying the truth, he's using the wrong measure. He's measuring himself by his own eyes. He's praying to himself. And he's praying in comparison to other people. And he's not using God's measure. It's always easy to, when you start praying to say, Lord, thank you that I'm not quite as bad. I, I, yeah, I've done some bad things, but hey, there's still somebody worse than me. But he trusts in himself. He thinks he's righteous, and he views other people with contempt. He's doing exactly what Paul spoke about in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves or against themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Paul just says a very simple thing. He says they're not too clever. But then you look at the tax collector, standing afar off, unwilling to even lift his eyes up to heaven, beating his breast. He's not even obedient to the scripture that says in Philippians 4 verse 6, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. It's, it's, it's shocking. He doesn't even thank God for anything. He doesn't even approach God in the right way by first coming and offering thanksgiving. And in fact, his prayer is not much of a prayer after all. It's just seven stupid little words. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And it's not a sinner, it is me, the sinner. He's a bit of a forerunner to Paul. He says in 1 Timothy 1.15, I am the chief of all sinners. This guy was pretty much in the same category. So amazingly, in this little picture given to us by Jesus, you have two men in the same place praying to the same God with drastically different results. The tax collector, the silly little seven-word prayer man, goes home fully justified, declared righteous, the Pharisee, with all his religious trappings and all of the religious pedigree, goes home not justified. One of them honored by God, the other dishonored by God. And then we get the punchline that explains what has happened with these two men. Jesus says, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. That's one of the promises you won't find in those little promise boxes. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. The Pharisee who exalted himself ends up humbled. And the tax collector who humbled himself stood afar off, couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, beat his chest, didn't even pray a proper kind of prayer, didn't even thank God properly, ends up exalted. And that line is repeated by Jesus on two other occasions. So I think Jesus really meant what he said. In Matthew 23, 12, where he's speaking woe upon the scribes and Pharisees, as well as in Luke 14, 11, the parable of the wedding feast. Three times Jesus makes an absolute promise to us. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so it is today with all of us. The counterfeit path to greatness for the world, the flesh, and the devil is through self-exaltation. Isaiah 14, 14, I will be just like the Most High. I'll be like God. The only path to true spiritual greatness is you humble yourself so that in time you can be exalted and so that you can live. You see, what they didn't tell you when you got saved, 
And they said, come to Jesus. Just ask Jesus into your heart. He'll solve all your problems. What they didn't tell you is that Jesus saves you, then he proceeds to kill you. Very, very slowly. Over many years. Is it because Jesus is cruel? Or he wants to get you? Of course not. But oh my, oh my, oh my. How we need to come into the great biblical truth that Jesus makes very, very, very clear to us. That the only way you can ever truly live is to die. The only way you can possibly enter into everything that God has promised and God desires for you, God requires for you, God has in mind concerning you, is for you to die so that you can live. Die so that you can truly live. And the only way you can truly live is to die to self. One of the few things that all four of the Gospels quote Jesus as saying is this. Matthew 10, 39. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Mark 8, 35. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Luke 13, 33. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. Then in John, you've got the primary cornerstone principle of the kingdom of God. In John 12, 24 to 26. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. For he who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. And amazingly, and as I said earlier, the, the word of God is just absolutely incredible. I don't know if you've ever seen the subtle differences in emphasis in all four of the Gospels. All four times Jesus speaks, whoever finds his life, whoever wants to save his life, whoever tries to keep his life, whoever loves his life. Each time he, it, it's quoted, it's, it's slightly different emphasis. It, it, it just covers every part of us dying to self. Not finding your life, and, and the world today says you've got to go and find yourself. No, you don't. Save your life, keep your life, love your life. It covers, all four of the Gospels cover the whole spectrum. And we know today that every single computer, every phone, every little thing that you've got on you has an operating system. And what the Lord showed me many, many years ago is that self, is the devil's operating system. On my computer, I've got programs that I can write and type with and edit pictures on and lay the magazine out and do all sorts of stuff, send emails. But none of those programs, as good and as sophisticated as they are, will work if they don't have an operating system. Most items today use either Windows or Android, or if you're very snooty, you have an Apple. I don't know what those things are, they're stupid. But the, uh, anybody here got apples? No, we're in the right place this morning. <laughs> but if you don't have Windows installed on your computer or Android on your phone, none of the other programs will even be able to be installed, let alone work. If the operating system doesn't work, nothing else works. The devil's operating system is self. You might still have areas of your life where the devil keeps freely coming in, hammering you, calling the shots, getting you to march according to his program. But the only way he can keep his programs running on the computer of your life is through the operating system of self. There may be a stronghold of pride in your life. 
that stronghold of pride can only keep functioning through the operating system. It will only work as long as self wants to be exalted, self gets hurt, self gets offended. You may have a problem with fear that the devil really comes and plays on. Again, the operating system for that fear is self. Fear is always rooted in something bad and something terrible might happen to me. Rebellion, the operating system of self, wants its own way. <clears throat> and so the devil's program of rebellion just keeps on running and endlessly running and getting stronger and bigger and more powerful. And so it goes with every area of our lives where the enemy has a foothold. The operating system of that foothold is self. Exactly as Jesus said, where you're still trying to find, save, keep, and love your own life. Do you know that the person who's under the control of a religious spirit is often the most selfish, self-centered person that you'll ever find? Why? Because they've got a little bit of biblical truth. But that biblical truth is now still running on the old operating system of self. That's exactly what we see in this picture in Luke 18. There's this Pharisee and he's running on an old operating system. It says Jesus is talking specifically to people using the operating system of self. They trust in themselves. They think they are righteous. They view other people with contempt. And then we see in the Pharisees' prayer, yes, maybe absolute truth. He's not like all the other people. Perhaps even truth that he fasts and he tithes and everything else. But he's just a centered, uh, sorry, self-centered, selfish, horrible person. And he just goes home with the same old operating system. Didn't even get Windows 98 or 95. He's still on Windows 3.1, I think it is. But the man who humbles himself, dies to self, goes home well on the road to getting a totally new operating system. Windows have been flung open. And he now has the open heaven operating system that gets a free update every single time that that man takes time to go and spend time with Jesus. He gets a huge update. And a lot of what the church today is trying to do is to patch up and minister to the operating system of self. Put an antivirus on the old operating system. Just minister to self. Make it look a bit better, feel a bit better. Just make you feel a bit better about yourself. Perhaps even upgrade self from Windows 95 to 98 or whatever. But Jesus says in all of this, the only way you can truly live, the only way you can come fully free from the devil's program is not to upgrade and keep trying to upgrade the old operating system. You have to have a totally new system. Die to self. Throw the whole lot out. Be made alive in Christ Jesus. And only then can you begin to run God's program. Romans 6, 11, even so, consider yourselves. Every day wake up and consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The devil needs a living body to work through. He can't use and operate through a dead man. So it's very simple to throw out the devil's operating system. Just die to self. Very easy. Do you remember some of the old computers used to have stickers on the inside? It was a big deal. Intel inside. It had an Intel chip, I think. Um, time to take off the me inside sticker on your life and just say, Jesus, 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 inside. Nothing else. So now, you're all going to be good and obedient little Christians. You're going to go out from here this morning and go and look for all sorts of ways to die. No, because God is a merciful and loving Father. 
He will allow more than enough circumstances and more than enough difficult people in your life to give you the opportunity for the old man to die. Your loving father will provide more than enough opportunity for you to die. You don't have to go and look for it, I promise you. And you can't sit here this morning and make a once and for all, all-time decision, this morning I'm going to go out and I'm going to go and die to self. But what God does clearly command us to do is to humble ourselves. That begins to get the old operating system kicked out. Humble yourselves. Don't let that pride and that rebellion and that self-justification rise up when things start getting rough. And be willing to die. Our response simply has to be one of moment-by-moment choices. A series of little deaths. Sometimes a hundred little deaths in one day. But they're all a little dying to self. Making those countless little choices of not my will, but yours be done, O God. Choices not to get offended, not to react, not to be hurt, not to keep a record of wrongs, and so on, and so on, and so on. Humbling yourself, denying yourself, gladly taking up whatever cross he has provided you with for this day. Don't go and looking for tomorrow's cross or next week's cross. Be it a cross of circumstance, physical affliction, difficult people, whatever. But just simply choosing to take up your cross, walk in forgiveness, walk in trust, walk in humility, and follow after him wherever he is taking you. And some of you, I think probably very, very few of you this morning, but are still under the illusion that the Christian life just gets easier the older you get. And the further you go in the Lord, it's just going to get easier. If it hasn't already been bursted, I'm sorry to have to burst your bubble for you this morning. <laughs> it just doesn't get easier. The further you go in the Lord, the deeper the lessons become. The oldest saints often have and go through the darkest of times. After 33 years here on earth, the Lord Jesus came to a place where among his very, very last words were, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His darkest hour was right at the end. Not one of the apostles lived out their lives in luxury in a place called Amber Glen or Amber Valley or Amber... How many of them are there now? Just listen to the awful testimony of Paul in 2 Timothy 4.10. The word of, uh, word of faith people would say, Man, Paul, where's your positive confession? What's wrong with you? He says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. Demas has deserted me. Crescens and Titus have gone. Only Luke is left. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. At my first defense, no one supported me. But all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. Does that sound like a triumphant, name it and claim it, Christian life that just got easier and better? But then you also mustn't forget that a few verses earlier, in the midst of all of that, he's saying in verses 7 and 8, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I believe it's in our darkest hours that we learn the greatest lessons in the Lord. It's in our darkest hours that we grow the most. It's in the times of deepest pain that we truly learn just how absolutely incredible and absolutely trustworthy Jesus really is. 
And I believe it's only in the darkest hours that the, the most enduring and precious ministries to the Lord are born. Nothing that I've ever come into in the Lord and that has ever been of any lasting value has ever just come through God coming one day and saying, well, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm, I want you to go there, get that, sort it all out and we'll get it all done. It's always been out of a total brokenness, a total weakness, a total yieldedness. I remember 1987 lying on the bathroom floor in Robertson, of all places, in the Cape, where every muscle in my body ached, my chest and everything was just aching from the sobbing. Coming out of there saying, Lord, I don't care where I go or what I do. I don't care if I never write another word again, if I'm never recognized, never do anything in your kingdom. I'll go and work behind the counter of the post office in Poffard. I don't know why I picked on Poffard. But I, no, I really did. I'll just go and work behind the counter in Poffard if that's where you want me. Ten days later, I was offered the job as editor of Personality magazine. A few years later, when God birthed Joy magazine, it took two long years. The people who were going to finance it in those days, PESCO, said this thing, they said that we want to do it, but it's impossible. This, this thing can never work. It won't pay its way. And so we died to it, and, and we took everything we'd gathered. We'd been sort of gathering material to prepare for it. We took the whole lot and threw it away and truly died to that magazine. Then suddenly one day the guy phones, he says, can you come down meeting, can you do a magazine? It's the first one in three weeks' time. <laughs> From absolutely nothing. All we could say was, Lord, if this truly is of you and if it truly is your ministry, you're going to have to do it supernaturally. And he did, with one day to spare. I don't know why he gave us the extra day, but anyway. Even with Prepare the Way, after we'd left Joy magazine and... and again came to a place of laying down the whole thing of writing and publishing and, and really, really, I came to a place of really covenant, covenanting with God and saying, Lord, I really don't care if I don't ever write or do another thing for you. Acts 20, verse 24. None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. That's why we're here, to just simply be a testimony to the gospel of the grace of God. And there's a lot of talk. I see a lot of talk from people who send me stuff talking a lot about God's end-time army. And they're looking for something mighty and triumphalist, a bunch of spiritual warfare experts who are going to go and take the land and pull down strongholds. If you're looking for that, you're looking for the wrong army. You really are. The only end-times army I find is Revelation 12, 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Totally willing to give up their lives, not defending and taking and grabbing and snatching. And Revelation 20 verse 4, I saw the souls of those who'd been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand. And they came to life. And this is where the, the end times army really is. They came to life and they reigned with Christ Jesus for a thousand years. And you see, some of you may be sort of thinking, well, I don't know if I'm going to be willing to give up my life one day in the future when the end time comes and maybe I didn't get raptured or maybe it was a post-trib uh, post rapture after all. 
And I just hope that I can hang in there and not deny Jesus. That's not an issue that's settled then. It's an issue that's settled now. If it becomes settled now, I willingly humble myself and die to self. I willingly give up my life for his name's sake. I promise you it won't even be an issue then. You'll be able to say that man died 50 years ago. He died 20 years ago or whatever. It won't even be an issue of you trying to hang on and cling on. And, Will I keep going? Will I keep true? If you truly do die to self now, the issue is fully settled. And what we've got to lay hold of this morning is, is that this is not just a die, 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 die thing. Not just dying to self and endlessly dying, dying, dying. It is dying to self so that you can begin finally to live the life that Jesus Christ saved you for. And Jesus makes it very, very clear that there is no other way into this life that he promises other than dying to self. But God never said just die to self and we'll have an empty vacuum. No, praise be to God. And, and if you just take one little thing home with you this morning, please let it be this. Please let it, let it just be that one thing that stays with you. That every single opportunity to die to self is a glorious opportunity for you to become more like Jesus. You see the devil will come, oh, you just got to die to self and you do, it's just this miserable Christian life. You've got to turn that thing totally around on its head and see that every single opportunity that God gives you to die to self is an opportunity that he's opening up for you to become more like Jesus. Philippians 2, 8 to 11, Jesus humbled himself. How? By becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, also, God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven, on the earth, under the earth, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. In Acts chapter 9 verse 5, Jesus came to a certain man and he said, Why are you kicking against the goads? Sorry. Why are you kicking against the goads? And that expression comes from when you have an ox or a horse pulling a wagon or something, and it suddenly comes to a stop and it just refuses to move. So you, you use a, a goad or a prick to try and get the animal to wake up and to move on. So Jesus said to this man, Saul of Tarsus, I'm pricking you. I'm goading you. And instead of simply humbling yourself and moving on with me, you're just kicking and lashing out and you, you're just kicking and beating the air and you're going absolutely nowhere. One interpretation I saw of kicking against the goads is that it's an exercise in futility. Refusing to die to self is the greatest exercise in futility that there is. To just be sitting there kicking against the goads, kicking and bucking and carrying on and getting absolutely nowhere. In verse 16, there's a part that's left out of most modern translations. The King James and the New King James, Paul's response is simply, Lord, what do you want me to do? And that should be our response. The literal version says, both trembling and being astonished. He said, Lord, what do you desire me to do? And as I say, you don't have to go and find, look and find all sorts of ways to die. But just simply have the humility to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Jesus told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they viewed others with contempt. 
Just as he did 2,000 years ago, Jesus is speaking to those this morning who still in some way trust in ourselves. He's still in some little vestige think we, there's just a little bit of righteousness there. Or who in some way despise or view other people with contempt. The Pharisee prayed to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week, I pay pay tithes on everything I get. The tax collector standing one some distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. One goes away fully justified, one totally not. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And very, very simply this morning, I just believe the Lord is wanting us to settle in our own hearts an even greater willingness to die to self. Not that you're going to go and kill yourself and do all sorts of stuff. But that you simply get and, and get alone with God and, and express that, that willingness to die more to self so that you have an opportunity to become more like Jesus. I laughed yesterday morning because soon after I started preparing, I saw that Gerard Lowe from Winterton had put a very, very deep spiritual truth on the WhatsApp message group. And, and, it, and it just confirmed for me that this was the right teaching for today. It says, he said, I has to die, die ek moet frek. <laughs> Amen. Die ek moet frek. Let's stand and let's pray. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> and Lord... We know your word and we've read your word and we've seen time and time again this need to die to self. And and probably many of us have tried this and that. And But God, may you just find in our hearts this morning a fresh willingness to say, Lord, let me humble myself before you. And as I humble myself before you, and as I, as I die to me and my and this, and I want that and I need that, that you will come in. Every little step of dying to self will mean becoming more and more and more like your precious son. What a bargain. What a promise. That, Lord, the enemy comes and just robs us, lies to us, keeps us from ever fully entering in to the glorious opportunity to die to self and to become more and more and more like you. Help us, Lord. Help us. Help us have a fresh start this morning to just be willing to be humble and to die to self. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.